Amen. Amen. That is appropriate for Father's Day. Please be seated. That's appropriate for Father's Day that we do acknowledge the faith of our fathers. You know, Father's Day, just a brief history, Father's Day was inaugurated in the U.S. in the earliest 20th century to complement Mother's Day uh, and to celebrate fatherhood and male parenting. The Father's Day was founded in Spokane, Washington at the YMCA in 1910 by a late woman by the name of Sonora Smart Dodd. Her father, who was a, a Civil War veteran, was a single parent, and he raised six children in Spokane. And after hearing a sermon about Mother's Day the, the previous year, in 1909, she told her pastor that fathers should have a similar holiday honoring them. But it didn't have much success initially because Americans kind of resisted the idea. They thought it was an attempt by merchants, by business, to replicate the commercial success a Mother's Day. So it was really resisted. But in 1957, uh, Maine Senator Margaret Chase Smith wrote a proposal that actually accused Congress of ignoring fathers for 40 years while honoring mothers, uh, thus singling out one, just one of our two parents. In 1966, Lyndon Johnson issued the first presidential proclamation honoring fathers designating the third Sunday in June as Father's Day. Six uh, years later, the day was made a permanent holiday when Richard, President Richard Nixon signed into the law in 1972. So that's a little history about Father's Day. Now, I am always amazed how we treat Father's Day. On Mother's Day, we hear sermons uh, exalting the role of mother in the family. Mothers are encouraged, they're praised, they're lifted up as the most important people in the home. And we should thank God for our mothers, our godly mothers. So that's Mother's Day. Then we come to Father's Day. Dad comes to church and hears a sermon on how he does not measure up as a father. He's told about some biblical father and the perfect life he lived, and dad leaves church feeling like a failure who will never measure up as a dad. Well, dad, you are special, too. You're special people, too. You're just as important as mom. Now, many experts actually uh, believe, now believe, that fathers can be just as nurturing and sensitive to their children as mothers. As children grow, fathers take on added roles of guiding their children's intellectual and social development. Even when a father is just playing with his children, he's nurturing their further development. So I'm not going to down you today, fathers. Uh, today I, want, I do want to talk about, though, about a man's place in the world. You know, men in general today have become reluctant warriors in a social revolution. Men everywhere are wanting to find their places in the world. Now, most of us here today, most of us grew up in a world that's very different from the world today. Uh, for example, at church, fathers and men went to the men's Bible class, and debated, is this the last day? Are we in the last days? While our mothers sang in the choir, helped in the nursery, and were the Sunday school teachers for the little kids. In the church business meetings, the men, our fathers, argued over whether to paint the church, or buy new pews, or to fire the pastor. And our mothers sat by their side dutifully presumably biblically, in silence. Today, though, middle-class lifestyles require two paychecks, not one. And the working mother 
who in more and more cases is bringing home half, and in many cases, more than half the bacon, is beginning to expect the working father to change half the diapers, wash half the dishes and the clothes, and run the vacuum half the time. The church is also changing much more slowly, but surely. Women are no longer silent. That's a good thing. Men no longer make all the decisions. We men, though, see the changes and reluctantly agree, but that doesn't mean that we really want to. Most men will move over and admit women's voices to the important decision-making processes of the church, but that doesn't mean that we really want to. Now, the reason, though, the reason for, for the reluctance is that so many women now are sitting in places traditionally, traditionally reserved for men, and so many men are having to sit in places traditionally the domain of women. And that, frankly, that makes men feel uncomfortable. It's threatening. It's challenging. It can be humiliating. And it makes us men wonder just what is a man's place in the world today? What is the domain, domain of man in the world? Does he have an exclusive role anymore? If so, what is it? Well, let's talk about a couple of things with regard to man's role spiritually in the world. And we're going to talk about it, and I'm going to use the scripture that Gene read earlier uh, in Judges chapter 7, verses through 15. Uh, you know, that, that's a story, and you read it all if you read Judges chapter 6 and 7, you'll get the full story. That's a story about Gideon uh, being called by the Lord to deliver the Israelites from the oppression of the Midianites. Uh, uh, now, in the scriptures Gene read in 7, 15 through 21, uh, every man that responded to Gideon's call was a volunteer. You know, the, the Midianites were threatening Gideon and the children of God. The people of Israel had done what was evil in the sight of God, and God placed them under the thumb of Midian. And Midian was bearing down on them to wipe them out, and they were camped in the valley of Israel preparing for the final onslaught. So when God called upon Gideon to sound an alarm, 32,000 men showed up at Mount Gilead to answer the threat. Now that's what it means to be a real man, a volunteer to fight for your people. Sadly, however, not all of them proved to be real men. Now here's what I mean. You look at uh, Judges chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. Is what it says. Early in the morning, Jerubbaal, that is Gideon, and all his men camped at the spring of Harod. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Moriah. The, God, the Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands, or Israel would boast against me. My strength has saved me. Now announce to the army, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left while 10,000 remained. So I figured it out. I figured it out. Of the 32,000 men who volunteered, only 32.25% stayed. So 67 and three quarters percent showed no firm conviction and were permitted to go home. So they left 10,000 men. Now Gideon, Gideon himself also, if you read the whole story, uh, knew what it meant not to have strong convictions because he didn't even volunteer in the beginning. He had to be drafted into this service by God. Again, remember the entire story is in Judges chapter 6 and 7. I'm not going to read it all, but I'm going to summarize it. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And Gideon's response was, Pardon me? Pardon me, Lord? 
Later on, the Lord said to Gideon, Go in the strength you have and save, me, save out Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Gideon's response, Pardon me? Excuse me, Lord? How can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest, and, he's a, and I am the least in my family. The Lord said, I will be with you, and you will strike down the Midianites, leaving none alive. Then Jesus then didn't reply. If now I found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it really talked to me. So Gideon was reluctant. He didn't volunteer. He was drafted. As a matter of fact, he asked God for a couple more, a couple more examples that he was the one. Remember uh, the, the, the dry place with being damp around and the damp place with it being dry. So it took a lot to get Gideon to agree. So Gideon was drafted, not volunteered. I'm going somewhere, and I'll get that in a minute. <laughs> Gideon was drafted, but he realized that his army needed to be all volunteer. You see, a volunteer army has greater motivation and commitment than an army of draftees. Volunteers believe in their cause and step forward without being coerced. God wants men to be volunteers, not draftees. Of all the whining that may be heard today, probably the loudest we, we men whine about comes from men who complain about women taking our place. They're only doing the same work that we're doing, and they have the gall to expect the same place. And just because we expect them to know about retail sales and computers and 40-hour work weeks, they we should learn about baby formulas, how to load the dishwasher. The one is whatever happened to the good old days when a home was a man's castle and his throne was the recliner in front of the television. There's nothing sacred anymore. And let me make something perfectly clear though. If a woman has occupied any place that God had really, had really intended for man to have, it has been because that man refused to step forward and volunteer. God's purposes will not be defeated because we men expect to be begged or because men want special places to be reserved for them in the home or the church or in the world. So if we men want to find our places in the world, we must surrender all our notions of our great necessities and our profound privilege. We must admit that God in his redemptive way has used the failure of us men to gain for woman a bigger piece of the action. This is God's justice and God's business and we're not going to turn it around and head it in the other direction. And we men need to re-enlist in our true places in God's world because women are finding their place in the world too. And it's not likely that we're going to ever return to the good old days. So let's talk about a couple of things today. Okay, Let's talk about a, a place in a man, the man's Place in the world today. First of all, a man a man is to is to volunteer. And we just talked about that. Don't wait to be drafted. Volunteer, and God will speak to you and tell you what He wants you to do. Volunteer and do it. Don't be like the twenty-two thousand men who really were did not have the conviction and leave. All right. A man's place is also to remain on spiritual alert. You volunteer, and a man's place is to, man, is to be spiritually alert. A Gideon's army was alert, equipped, and ready to go. Now God insisted that the army be diligent, vigilant, sorry, vigilant. But God had to trim its ranks far below the $10,000 figure in order to display his own strength. As a test, he chose 
was to have Gideon administer a, minister a test to determine who among the 10,000 men were alert. After all, the Midianites were encamped just a few miles to the north, so a man must remain watchful. Let me call your attention to Judges chapter 7, verses 4 through 7. Judges 7, 4 through 7. But the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many men. Take them down to the water, and I will send them out for you there. If I say this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So Gideon took the men down to the water. There the Lord told him, separate those who lap the water with their tongues as a dog laps from those who kneel down to drink. Three hundred of them drank from cupped hands, laughing like dogs. All the rest got down on their knees to drink. Then the Lord said to Gideon, with the, with the 300 men that left, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let the others go home. And remember what I said. A man's place is to remain spiritually alert. When most of those men laid down their weapons and put their faces down to the water to drink, Gideon knew they were not God's men for this task. They were not alert. Only the 300 men who kept their heads up and drank from their hands while they walked were acceptable. So then, then, Gideon equipped the 300 men, these 300 men with some very strange stuff. As 9,700 men headed for home, he appropriated their earthenware jars, their torches, and their pockets. He placed a torch inside each jar, issued a jar and a trumpet to each man. And these would be the weapons that the force of 300 would use against their mighty enemy. And this tactic seemed unusual and ineffective in the face of such an adversary, but it was God's choice. God wants us to be alert to his voice and prepared for action. The failure for us men today is not that we do not have our eyes on our enemies, but that we do not have our eyes on God. Prayer, we have our eyes, we're looking at the enemy, but we do not have our eyes on God. Prayer and meditation are the means by which a man will see God, but these activities that men have by and large surrendered to women. Is it an accident, men, that most prayer chains in our churches are handled by women? Or that most of the people who sing in the choir beyond an early age are female? Or that the groups that gather to pray for missions are women's prayer groups? Prayer men, is no longer a man's fixation. We men have our eyes upon something besides prayer because we have our eyes on something besides God. Gideon's men must have looked with a great deal of suspicion on what they were given, these jars with torches inside them and trump these trumpets. Now, wouldn't these puny anemic weapons against a formidable foe as men mean defeat? Well, Christian men today look with intense suspicion of one prayer, one music, and praise upon missions, study, and upon the power of the preaching and teaching of God's word. Not that we never practice any of it, but we don't believe there's power in it. Just like it appeared to these men that their weapons were inadequate, we men sometimes think that prayer and meditation and preaching are inadequate. It's better for us to rely on our own manly intelligence, on our powers of persuasion, 
our own willingness to work 60 to 70 hours or our own dogged determination and high blood pressure to get the job done. Gideon's 300 men demonstrated the fact that they were real men and that Gideon and the Lord had not made a mistake in their selection. This little army of big men dutifully shouldered their trumpets and their clay jars and began to march down the mountain and into the battle. So for us today, we must be men, spiritually alert, and finally, a man's place is to set his world, set our world according to a standard of obedience to God. Judges chapter 7, verse 21 says, While each man held his position around the camp, all the Midianites ran crying out as they fled. Every man in Gideon's army found his place. At the outskirts of the Midian encampment, there was to be no charge, no fuss, no fury, no swords for the adversary. On cue from Gideon, all 300 soldiers blew their trumpets, broke their jars, and held their torches high. Together they sounded the battle cry, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Now this sound and light show so, so shocked and startled and confused the Midianites that they started running, drew their swords against each other, and hacked each other to pieces. The men stood on obedience to God. The important thing to notice is that each man in Gideon's army did exactly as he was instructed. Obedience is the most essential part of our faith. We've talked about that a good bit in Bible school. Obedience is the most essential part of faith. To trust is to obey. In the final analysis, a man's place is the same as everybody's place. Obedience to God's call and claim on his life. But we can't say, I don't know my place anymore. I don't know what's expected of me. I don't know where it ends. God's word teaches us men our place. God's word calls a man to spiritual headship in his home. And this doesn't mean that he makes all the decisions any more that it frees him from giving baths to babies and reading bedtime stories. It does mean that he sets a standard of obedience to God for his family. If anybody in the family is faithful to God, he is. If anybody wants prayers to be said and scriptures to be read, he does. If anybody insists that the family gets up and attends the church that Jesus loves, he's the one that insists. If anybody ties the family's income, he ties. Be an example, man. The Lord created fathers to play a formidable role. Role. He charges us with the hefty responsibility to raise our children in the Lord. Fathering done right transforms boys into servants hearted gentlemen and girls into confident women who know their worth. God calls a man to responsible manhood under the headship of Jesus Christ. You know, children and youth, whether they have a faithful father back home or not, need for Christian men to set the standard of obedience to God. If the young ever learn what it means to relate to God as a father, they will learn it by relating to one of God's faithful men. It will make all the difference in the world today if all men would be men of God. I'm talking about volunteering. A volunteer, a man or a woman, must be equipped for the work and the Holy Spirit equips us. I'm going to talk about that now. So men... First of all, our place in the world, one, is to volunteer 
when God says move, volunteer and move. Go and move. Don't sit back because if you do, God's going to call a woman to do that. His work will not stop. So men volunteer when called. Number two, remain spiritually alert. Keep your eyes on the Holy Spirit. Listen to him when he speaks to you. Expect him to speak to you and be spiritual. Volunteer, be alert, and then obey. Volunteer, be alert, and then obey. And then we will be the men of God that he expects us to be. Now, there may be some men, either here, and I don't see any here, but there might be, or those who will uh, hear this message on YouTube later, who would like to volunteer, but they are not equipped. In order to be an effective volunteer in the kingdom of God, you must be equipped. And that equipment comes from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will, will equip you to accomplish what it is God calls you to do and to be. But the only way that happens, though, you don't just get the Holy Spirit. You get the Holy Spirit when you call on Jesus and ask him to be the Lord of your life. When you realize that as a man, I have a sinful, I'm a sinful, I cannot do it myself. I need some help. I need a savior. When we decide that men and women, when we decide we need the equipment, how do I get it? We need to call on Jesus to get it. And what the Bible says is that if we want to confess our sins, that we're sinners, right? And we believe that Jesus, the Son of God, came to pay the penalty for our sin, to die on a cross, to accept our, the penalty of our sin. And we agree that he did that, confessing with sinners, we agree that we have a Savior who has paid the penalty for us, that through death on a cross, that he was buried and raised on the third day and is now with God, you are saved. Then you get the equipment to be an effective volunteer. So if anyone who's not done that, it's that simple. What did I say? Believe and confess and ask God and Jesus to come into your life, and he will, and you will be equipped to be an effective volunteer. Then you can do what Jesus said do. Jesus said to go into all the world and preach the gospel. You can't do that without equipment. So let's get equipped, men. Let's, let's, let's today say that we are going to, to, to take that equipment that the Holy Spirit has given us. We're going to volunteer. We're going to watch so that we're spiritually alert. And we're going to obey so that we're examples to the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you today, today for your word. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for letting us know today that you need men. You expect men to volunteer, that you provide men with all the equipment that they need to do the work that you call them for. All we need to do is to obey. Father, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, I will... I will, will, will pronounce the, the uh, benediction, and then what we're going to do, once I pronounce the benediction, we'll go ahead and get prepared for the baptism. Let me do that. May Christ dwell in your heart through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God.